Good afternoon, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. It is three o'clock on a Thursday. That means that it is time for Agave sessions. Um, as often happens with the live streaming age, we had a couple of technical difficulties. So apologies for getting started a few minutes late. Um, I'm very lucky this afternoon to have a return guest, which I always like because we get to kind of geek out a little bit more and go a little bit deeper into certain topics. Um, but this uh, afternoon, I'm really excited to, uh, to be talking with my friend Ben because uh, he worked with a really wonderful uh, uh, group in Tucson um, and runs a really interesting project for the university there, if you don't remember from last time. And they have put together an upcoming series of really incredible agave education seminars and tasting over the course of the next few months. And we're going to get all into that, the programming, the speakers that they have lined up, kind of what their thought process was and their goals are. Um, so I'm really, really excited to help him get the word out about that. Um, he's based in Tucson. You guys know how much I love my hometown. So anytime that we get an opportunity to promote projects going on there within the agave space, we're more than happy to do that. Um, so please help me uh, in welcoming on my good friend, Ben Wilder from the Desert Laboratory at Tumamak Hill in Tucson, Arizona. Ben, how are you doing, bud? Hey, Francisco. I'm doing great. Good to see you. Good to be back. Thank you, man. Hey, I got to say that was right there, that was probably the least amount of lag time that I've ever had between when I actually said hello to somebody and they actually figured out to get their camera and their mute off. So good work. It's a Zoom world these days. <laughs> so how are things out there at Tucson, man? Looks like you're doing well. You know, it's a roller coaster. We're hanging in. Keep your head down. Um, pray for rain and, and, uh, and more vaccines. <laughs> pretty much you know now that i think about it where you guys are in tucson it's got to be a little bit interesting and also obviously not just the natural environment directly around where the desert laboratory is um, but just for those people who don't know there's this big mountain kind of in the middle of western tucson and up about halfway up this mountain is where the desert laboratory is uh and uh it's really interesting because you just you 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 go up to this building and then you're in the above the city in the middle of the city. So I feel like that has to give you a little bit of a respite from the craziness that's going on down in down in the actual city. You know, I'm so fortunate and just feel so um, grateful to be able to come here to work every day. It's uh, such not the reality for ninety five percent of everyone on the planet right now and so to be here and connected to the desert around us and to have that perspective um looking at these beautiful rain clouds going by right now it makes it makes it a lot easier so, yeah and you know that's one of the things that i'm really grateful for being in the line of work that i am because you know i, I could work in a bar um, which is great and it's wonderful. And I had a, I've had a wonderful, I had a wonderful run when I was working behind the bar. Um, and, and there's absolutely nothing wrong if you want that to be your long-term career path. But I feel very fortunate in that my particular path within the world of food and drink has afforded me an opportunity to have me obviously not as, as, as deep of a connection to the environment as you get on a daily basis, but through Mezcal, to really have that connection to to the, the natural world uh, around us and, and a deeper appreciation and just hearing you talk about how it's not the that that's not the case for so many people it just it just makes me think about how tragic it is that even people in their own day to day lives could somehow could possibly be more enriched or or have a little bit of an opportunity for escape if they just looked around them and had that connection to the natural world around them you know because i think about that being here in new york city and growing up as you know very close to where you're located right now how much i took that for granted by just not being aware of what was around me uh in the natural environment around uh, uh, directly in front of me yeah totally and those spaces in our respective communities where you can get that connection to nature are so important um, right now and, and take on the whole new meaning of complexity of what's safe, what's not, but how important it is to connect outside. And so that's, I mean, thinking about here at Tumamak Hill, I mean, we've it's continued to be used by close to a thousand people a day. We just on um, had a beautiful day here on Monday on Martin Luther King Jr. Day. We had over 1,500 people hiking the hill. <clears throat> um, and so it's, you know, it's, it's a, nerve-wracking for me because you know what, what's safe um 
what's not right now, but at the same time, uh, it's a beautiful thing because, um, well, people are connecting and they're being here and they're connecting to friends and they're, there's a sense of normalcy and, um, and uh, something that they can look forward to and, and get outside of. Uh, directly in front, sorry. Um, and that actually kind of opens opens up my, what was gonna be my next question and, and, and we'll get to, to, to the agave renaissance in just a moment. But out of my own curiosity, you know, have you seen that, have you seen that appreciation develop in the Tucson community? Um, because, and the reason I ask is because, you know, just in, 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 in growing up, you know, I would drive by the road that, that, that your driveway or whatever, you know, the, 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 where, where the road to the lab spills out onto the main thoroughfare. And I've just, over the years, I've seen so many more people year in, year, you know, just year over year start to use that, the, the, that hill, that space, et cetera. And in my travels for Mezcal Vago, I've been very fortunate enough to visit communities all over the country. And, you know, I'm, I'm oftentimes reminded of communities in the Pacific Northwest comes to mind where they usually were, where a, a large portion of the population seems to have a very strong connection to the natural world, to the mountains, to the forest. And growing up in Tucson when I was younger, I didn't really see that as much, you know, and it strikes me as interesting because Tucson is an, is an, obviously it's incredibly hot in the summertime. It's oppressively hot, which can be restrictive to a certain extent in your ability to be active outdoors and connect with the land. But overall, even in the wintertime, I didn't get that same kind of sense of outdoor community growing up as prevalently around Tucson as I've seen in other places in the West. Um, you know, and, and, and again, I, I hearken back to my con contrasting my experiences out here in the East and, and, you know, living in a very heavily urbanized environment. And I just feel like it might be an opportunity that people are missing out on in Southern Arizona. And yet, you know, like you said, you had 1500 people in the, out on the mountain yesterday. So it seems like it's something that is starting to, I, I, I feel like I've seen that start to change a little bit over the last 10, 20 years that I've been away from Tucson, going back home to Tucson and just seeing it, you know, checking in periodically. Yeah, I mean, <clears throat> there's, let me put it this way, um, housing prices have not dropped here recently uh, <laughs> during the pandemic. And, and I think it's because people are reevaluating what are, what are core elements that are important to us of where we live. Mm -hmm. And um, man, being in, a, in an area that you can get outside to natural area uh, settings and have a great restaurant scene and a great art scene, um, you know, I think we can think of several communities like that, and, and Tucson's one of them. So it checks a lot of boxes, and, and people are, um, uh, you know, it's, it's a beautiful day right now where it's uh, darn cold in many other parts of the country. So That's one of the other things, too, that I think, you know, you, you mentioned the food, the, 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 the food dining scene in Tucson, and, you know, there's a great, and I think we touched on it uh, um in our last conversation, but there's a great, great wealth of sustenance that exists in the desert if you know how to find it, right, and how to access it and how to utilize that. Um, and, you know, I, I, please feel free to correct me if I'm wrong, but I feel like that's something that maybe the, the, the food and dining scene has, has not tapped to its full potential, right, which isn't to say that they have taken it for granted or haven't tried to, you know, incorporate southwestern native food ways into their food programs but i feel like there's a lot of potential there for it to be explored and opened up even more you know and obviously we mentioned last time your dad being a chef i don't know he's tried a lot to to incorporate that into his food pro in, into his food program and stuff like that but i feel like it really just is is even to this day a slightly untapped resource and it just seems like a really wonderful way to help people connect with the land in a way that they might not typically have thought of that connection being being accessible to them. Yeah, I would take, you know, so there is the, I'd say the food scene here is a, a step ahead of where the rest of the community is in terms of um, where we get our produce from, where mm -hmm. we get our agriculture from. And I think that, <clears throat> yes, there can always be more and, and it's, there's, it's trending in that direction, but to get, take it maybe to a step further and, and scale out a little bit more is the food resilience <clears throat> and food sustainability. 
And we've seen, and Agave plays into this uh, in terms of both itself, but then also the concept of arid land agriculture is we've seen through the pandemic how stressed we are on um, and how out of whack our food systems are in terms of we're not self-sufficient. Um, and we depend on so many other far strong networks of uh, getting our food that when the, that food chain breaks down, <clears throat> there's not a lot of, uh, of uh, safety net. And to you, as you mentioned, there is a remarkable amount of, um, excuse me for the jet noise. <clears throat> Can't hear you. Yeah, no, there was. Oh, oh, got it, got it, got it. So, on uh, um, there's a, a a really remarkable uh, number of species of uh, food species, uh, agricultural species that are native to the dry land regions, the borderland region of Southwest U.S., northern northwestern Mexico, um, that are actually the progenitors of many of the staple crops throughout the world. I mean, I'm talking corn, beans, chili, squash, cotton, um, oh, so on and so forth. <clears throat> and so we really have a remarkable potential to reinvest and to re-explore and reconnect to these food sources and food ways that, um, that is, we've kind of strayed away with um, as, the, uh, as colonialism supplanted native cultures and so much technology and knowledge of how to exist in an arid environment. Mm -hmm. And there have been pioneers that are leading this effort from Richard Felger to Gary Nabhan, um, Howard Gentry with Agaves, Wendy Hodgson, who spoke on our series first last night, <clears throat> and, and others um, that uh, are re, uh, re-establishing our links with this knowledge um, from an ethnobotanical sense, from kind of a merging with modern agricultural technology. And so just to your point about the using local ingredients, that sense of place we were just talking about, about connecting the outdoors area, but that sense of place is so linked with food everywhere too. There's some real strengths here um, in our region that, uh, that when we have a big project right now, we're calling it the Arid America Food Resiliency uh, Project that we're putting gardens down at the base of Tumamac in the coming months. Uh, we're working with so many partners in town from Mission Gardens to the Desert Museum to the um, Kitchen Garden with the College of Agriculture and Life Sciences here. And anyway, <clears throat> a lot of very promising and important programming there. You know, when, when you're speaking about uh, food resiliency and, and kind of rediscovery of these traditional foodways, um, you know, one of the things, since we're talking about agriculture, one of the things that immediately pops up in my mind as being a little bit of a red flag is the issue of um, is the issue of of uh, water accessibility. You know, so I, I'm wondering as people try to work to rediscover these foodways, are they also obviously I would imagine trying to find creative ways to mitigate water issues and 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 how to balance water use against trying to, to you know, how, how can you grow stuff if, if your water accessibility is becoming increasingly, increasingly scarce? I right? don't know if this is going to work, <clears throat> but can you see that out in the mountains over there? Oh God, yes. <laughs> Hold that up for a second. Let us, here, uh, let me, let us, let me put you on uh, spotlight for everybody. There we go. That's got it. Oh my goodness. Look at that shot. <laughs> so there, there you go. That's what we need to do. Harvest that. <laughs> That's the answer. I mean, and it's true. We have here in the desert, you know, on an average year, which last year was not, um, you get about 12 inches of rain a year. If we did had a uh, wide scale uh, rainwater harvesting um, systems, <clears throat> we would be dang close to having the water needs um, met for our city of about a million people. And, and it's, I mean, it's, <laughs> that's one of these things that's like, when you talk about resiliency or adaptations and to climate change, there's some real low hanging fruit of things we can do. And to me, that's, that's the, one of the biggest, um, I would say even in step with and maybe ahead of solar energy. <clears throat> um, so 
do we, I mean, so talking about the, the in arid lands and, and water being a concern, yeah, 100% it's a concern. But if you just do a better job of harvesting what comes from the sky, one, and then two, we have the technology for uh, treating effluent and to create really our, um, our wastewater systems. And it, it's already, I mean, the technology is here, but there's not the societal will to um, utilize that in, in diverse ways. So I, yeah, I think water is scary as we're entering periods of drought, but um, there's things we can implement immediately that, uh, that address some these issues and get us still pretty dang close to where we need to be. Um, kind of going back to what we were speaking about earlier and, and kind of what, what, uh, what, for me growing up, I saw, I look back and now see as a lack of connection with the natural world around me and, and not just for myself, but I think the, the, a large part of the Tucson community um, at large, uh, you know, I've seen that change over the years, as I mentioned, and I think it, it, the momentum, I see most momentum kind of shifting in, in Arizona. And I think, you know, I think of, I think of, of, of projects like the, the desert museum, right. Which has now be, which has now become such a popular attraction and such a big part of the community and the, and, and understanding the ecology of the desert for the public at large and things like that. Uh, I'm really curious, you know, have you seen people, uh, uh, start to access, you know, the desert lab and, 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 learn and, and explore what you guys are doing to help foster the understanding of the natural world or is it or is what you guys are doing at the desert lab still pretty much exists within the world of academia so we're trying to break down that wall <clears throat> and let people come in and so we're we're at the outset of of, of realizing that vision um of a of a of a having solutions that and information that apply to people's everyday lives and that and that there's making that link making that connection of how the, the studies we do here the um the long-term trends we're seeing the um the cultural history of the site and everything we're talking about right now like keep making people aware of that and and having them come and understand and so this garden project i just referenced at the bottom of the hill it's, you know, there are many elements to it, but it, one of them is that it's an inspiration piece. It's this, oh man, I can replicate that in my backyard easily, or I can come here and do community garden, or I can call up that landscaping company, Desert Survivors, and, and get three of those plants that are awesome. Um, and so that's, a, that's one of the long-term goals here. It's not easy um, because it requires a lot of different skill sets that are not necessarily what I got my PhD in. Um, and then it requires investment from, from the university, from the community to help support our efforts in terms of, we need people to run those programs. Um, but it's doable and there's amazing models, uh, both in, within Tucson, the Desert Museum you mentioned, does an incredible job of telling the story of the desert. Um, and inspiring people about the importance of, of this area. Mission Gardens does an awesome job of um, this agricultural element and connecting to the community. But <clears throat> you think of Desert Botanical Gardens in Phoenix, they do an incredible job with this. Um, Rancho Santa Ana, uh, or now called California Botanical Gardens in the Claremont area in Southern California is awesome. Um, the Santa Barbara Botanical Gardens. Anyway, we could just go all throughout the country and find spaces for this um but i think it's a it's a direction we're heading in and it's a direction many people are heading into because if you just stay within your academic bubble we've seen that that, that doesn't get us very far and actually can lead to a distrust of science um because we're not doing a good job in part of communicating what we're actually doing i have kind of an interesting question that it might be a little bit difficult to navigate but i i, I think you you you'll you're under, you'll, you'll understand where where i'm coming where i'm coming from um you know we, we last time we talked about kind of some colonialism that that still exists in academia right and kind of the appreciation for the appreciation for uh for um for uh indigenous knowledge, right, for, for traditional knowledge. 
And I see that in the accessibility and not necessarily the accessibility, but kind of the outreach, right? Like a lot of times kind of the, when, when I think of, of the outdoor community, a lot of times it, it, it doesn't necessarily reflect a huge amount of diversity in the people that are embracing it. Do you find that as well in people that are in, in the general public who are coming to, who are, who are embracing or, or at least um, kind of filling that space that you guys are trying to create for the public? Or do you see a pretty healthy diversity and reflection of the Tucson community in the people that are responding to the programming that you guys are starting to put out there? Because I think of growing up as a little Hispanic kid in the barrio, which is where my grandparents live, and I spent all my time with them because my mom was working or in law school or what have you. And, you know, we didn't spend a lot of time going outdoors. We didn't spend a lot of time learning about the natural world around us. We spent a lot of time just kind of riding bikes around the neighborhood. You know, and that's the reason that I asked that question, especially the Desert Lab being in the middle of a predominantly Hispanic part of town. You know, do you see the do you see a, a diverse snapshot of the community responding or is that something that you guys are seeing or, or that you foresee a challenge with? And I know that's kind of a weird question, but it just reflects my own experience growing up in the west side of Tucson. Yeah, awesome question. And it's a two tiered answer with the caveat that I'm going to respond to that from as the director of the Desert of Laboratory in Tumamak Hill. So this um, doesn't necessarily apply to other institutions directly. So it's a two tiered answer. First tier, we are in the really unique and remarkably beautiful scenario that we probably, I manage the most diverse site probably in the city of Tucson. Uh, and so the people that come here to walk and they're coming for reasons of exercise, reasons of the connection to the natural world we talked about earlier. I mean, it's a myriad of reasons. And that's one of the really cool things is people, everyone comes here for a different reason. Um, and with a different life experience, of course. But when you break down those, that 1,000 or 1,500 people a day, it's everybody. I mean, it, it's the most um, demographically diverse uh, breakdown of our city that I think any site has by age, by zip code, by ethnicity, by education, by political view, by income, whatever, doesn't matter. So, so that's pretty freaking awesome in the first place. And, and there's just this natural experiment that's happened that I'm doing everything I can to not screw up. Um, <laughs> and then the second tier is who we're engaging with our programming with, um, uh, the Agave Renaissance series, for example, that we're doing right now from our Friends of Tumamak program, our um, Instagram or whatever, you know, any of the marketing things or social media pieces or communications you do. And that's a mixed bag. You know, there's, there's a, definitely a, um, a core constituency that is maybe kind of stereotypical for who you would have from a um, academic um, profile talking kind of a scientific institution. Mm -hmm. And, but then at the same time, it, it's, there's connections that we've made that are not stereo, that are not um, within a confined sector. And we're actively seeking that out. So from it, I'll, let me give some examples before, before I do so, it's essentially, it takes concerted uh, effort and, and, um, and collaboration and um, an iterative process of learning how we can better communicate and, <clears throat> and do so in different ways, right? I have a lot of blind spots in terms of um, who, how to act effectively communicate with uh, people that may not think the way I do or have the background of experience. And this is everything from, you know, the language you use and having like, uh, you know, being trapped in scientific jargon and making it more approachable to lay people, or in all the way to, you know, is it culturally relevant? Um, yeah. And so, and that's talking about different ethnicities with indigenous communities, so mm -hmm. forth, right? So for example, with the, we have a program um, working overtly with artists and connecting artists and scientists and bringing in a really, um, you know, diverse in terms of ways of thinking and background and, and networks, but also, um, you know, diverse in many ways, group of, of artists that uh, from the community to have us come together and think about 
the knee, the narratives and the themes of Tumamak Hill uh, mm -hmm. and how we can tell that story to the community and using different lenses to do so that are not necessarily the ones that people on my staff or myself would think to do that way. So bringing in a transdisciplinary perspective, meaning ultimately seeing the world through different eyes than our own and incorporating those fundamentally in how we tell stories. Uh, so doing that through the arts to trying to do that <clears throat> with the partnering we're doing with these programmings and it's, um, and, and the other one is making um, meaningful and, uh, you know, um, relationships with indigenous uh, partners and native nations that are um, honest and sustained mm -hmm. and, uh, and trying to find mutual points of connection that, that, uh, that require a, a lot of time and, um, and, and iteration and understanding of where those points of connection are and, and honesty. And, you know, <clears throat> first thing is I just on that point is like, we have a lot of explaining to do in terms of how uh, we, the University of Arizona, we, the Desert Laboratories, originally founded by the Carding Institution, have managed these lands, have managed such a sacred site as Chimamagi Duag. And, <clears throat> and a lot of that's been really ugly and uh, very dark histories there. And so I think that's where you, you know, so thinking about um, seeing who's coming, what that uh, point of connection is, a lot of the questions I'm getting from Don Atom and, and other Native Nations people is, are we welcome? You know, I, are, can we, is it, is it comfortable? Are we able to be on site? And the answer is like, yes, absolutely. I'm trying, we're doing our best to steward this space for you um, particularly, and to, so that we don't have this further erosion of, um, of cultural landscape. But that's such an important thing to know is that's where the starting point is, right? We've got a long way to go, and we're working on many fronts on many different projects. The Agave uh, project topics being one of them. Very exciting project to, that kind of parallels the lecture series um, that we can get into in a bit. We should get into because that's super cool. <clears throat> um, so long-winded answer to your question, but uh, the potential is there in a really profound ways, and uh, we're taking our steps to, to realize that. That's wonderful, man. I, and I really want to extend, you know, just take a hard stop and, and very deliberately say thank you for having that conversation right now because, you know, and I know that we hadn't talked about addressing that what previously and, and that was just something that kind of popped into my head, um, you know, because, you know, obviously for the people at home, most of you probably already know, but, you know, the cultural erasure is a very, is a very real thing, even, even currently, right? Particularly, um, not particularly, but 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 in within the very the various indigenous cultures of Mexico. You know, I posted something to my Instagram about some about another example of a designer. You know, uh, appropriating very clearly appropriating a design scheme and a textile theme and a color theme from a very particular place in Northern Oaxaca called the Mazateca. Um, you know, I think back to our conversation again about indigenous knowledge and kind of taking that indigenous knowledge and, and traditional knowledge and then kind of evolving that within the world of academia, which has historically been, has, has historically had some pretty hard barriers to, 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 to entry set up within it, right? And I know that given your work in indigenous communities in Sonora, I really wanted to hear your perspective because obviously as somebody who came up, you know, studying under, under people like Gary Nabhan, for example, who also have very strong connections to these communities, I really just wanted, I, I really thought you would have a really wonderful perspective and, and I was not disappointed at all. So, so thank you very much. And I know that it's very, very difficult to navigate and, and that kind of erasure is something that, that that is a threat even in the spirits community, you know, as, as, as more and more people find a space for themselves in the chain of supply, people get further and further removed from the producer, from the communities, right? Which is a topic that I, I, I try and talk about a lot to make sure that we maintain that connection for people. And it's because I think that's one of the beautiful things about the spirit, about that category. And um, yeah, I don't know. I think just how much work you guys do at Tumamak Hill in so many different facets about the natural world. And, you know, it, it's really wonderful to see 
that being embraced and seeing you guys think very consciously about how we can make it accessible for all the people, particularly the people who have who have just existed in this space for thousands of years, you know, and, and how to continue that relationship into the future. So thank you very much for, for, for taking some time to talk to us yeah. about. Well, you're welcome. And, and thank you for your kind words there. I'll, I'll just say one other thing on the topic, you know, that for me, it's been an iterative process of identifying my blind spots too, mm -hmm. and being, being open to do so. Um, so I'll give one example. So we, at the base of the hill, there is a, um, a shrine to the, the Virgin of Guadalupe. That's a kind of a folk shrine, a community shrine that was established, has its own history. Um, and it's, it's very embraced, of course, by the Hispanic community, but, but broadly, um, uh, many walkers uh, that are religious or not connect to it. And so we did a, um, when we repaved the road, we had a community fundraising, uh, crowdfunding campaign. And we used the shrine and the image of the Virgin Guadalupe as a, as kind of a, a principal image in terms of our communication strategy with that and a presenting to the uh, a group called the four southern tribes which is the um uh, a com uh the four principal um tribes here in southern arizona <clears throat> shared that project and that and that um and that marketing campaign and, and there is just kind of a full stop conversation it's like why is that image what you're using to depict the hill and, and that com directly continues the erasure of this being autumn land and of this being um, uh, a site that is sacred to our communities. And we're not depicted anywhere in there. I was like, you're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. And so it's, you know, continuing to check ourselves and run through the filters and think and, and learn and, and, uh, and do better. Hope you're muted. So uh, one of the ways that you, you know, that we, we've kind of danced around it. And when I, when I, when I pitched you coming back on the show again, it was for the whole idea about talking about this. And as, as often happens with, with people and good conversation, we kind of get sidetracked a little bit. Um, one of the ways that you, you know, one of the tools that, that I think you mentioned you've used to create that sense of community and establish that connection and help people understand the world, the natural world around them, and also highlight this traditional knowledge is through agave, right? Which I think is part of the is, is part of the whole reason that you guys started your agave renaissance series that 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 I've posted about. Um, we've shared from from Vaga's page, from my own personal page. Um, but I'd really love it if you could explain to people. I know you guys kicked it off last night. I got my days mixed up. I thought I was going to be able to watch this evening. Um, but the first uh, the, too. what's that? We got something tonight too. Don't worry. Dude, there is the tasting this evening, which I think I did RSVP for. Um, and if not, I will do so in a minute. So um, if you could just kind of explain to people what that is, how you guys kind of created this project and, and who you guys are, are going to be uh, have joining you, I think that would be really wonderful. Um, and, and also obviously uh, how people can register as well. Let me start with that because I'll forget once we start <laughs> getting into the details. So go to, uh, and if you guys can put the link in the chatter there. So tumamoc.arizona.edu slash agave underscore series. That's T-U-M-A-M-O-C dot A-R-I-Z-O-N-A dot E-D-U slash agave underscore series. Um, that, that's the landing page. You can register there, see all the presentations, um, link to our, the presentations, to the tastings, go to Hotel Congress, buy the, the mezcal um, tastings uh, for the, you know, the bottles for the tastings. If you're in Tucson, pick it up at Hotel Congress. If you're elsewhere, go to the um, <clears throat> your local store and get something tasty. So that's the, the logistics. Um, it really start, started uh, and continues with the space here, with, with Tumamak Hill. And so what I mean by that is on our um, northwestern portion on the flats. So I'm going to try to paint a picture for everyone here. You have the Santa Cruz River, which is just kind of cuts through the edge of downtown Tucson, which is now generally a dry river, but it was, um, uh, especially in this area, was a perennial river for hundreds, if not thousands of years. That is the reason that Tucson is the longest continuously inhabited site in the United States. Water in the desert brings life. It brought people. You have an 800 foot volcanic hill, what I'm sitting on right now and talking to you from, that oversees the entire city. Uh, of the entire valley. So it's a natural draw for people. 
on just to the west on the flats, uh, just off the hills road, coming down the Tucson Mountains. I showed you that view through my window just about 15 minutes ago. There is a field there that is a, a, a reworked uh, landscape by the Hohokam or the Huokam people about 1500 years ago. That's an agave field. What I mean is it has these uh, a whole bunch of rock piles. So it literally is what it sounds like. A pile of volcanic rocks, in this case, because the, the, the rock on the ground is the geology here, piled up. Um, there's probably about, you know, two, two times of what I can close in my arms in a circle, and maybe one per every 20 square meters or something. So not very dense. <clears throat> and then down this slope, there's little water channels, and there's little rock check dams that have been built to slow the water, capture it, and divert it to these rock piles. These rock piles are essentially mulch um, or their growing environments for the agave. So on each of these rock piles, an agave was planted and, and grew up because you get the extra moisture that's retained in the rocks there. Uh, and it's this really low, perfect growing environment. And they had thousands of these rock piles <clears throat> on the hill. So there's it was an agave field and there's roasting pits throughout the, the property. Here, the, um, they're about over a dozen. They're usually done in the wash. And this was a food crop and also, of course, for fiber and what, and maybe for fermentation, but there's no direct example, evidence of that. It doesn't really hold itself in the archeological record. So we're, <clears throat> we're walking through this landscape and, it, um, and there's a couple of things that came to mind is one is it, uh, it felt empty because the agaves are no longer there. They require people to maintain them. It's a little too arid here um, for them just to be uh, left untended. They have to have this technology um, and it is a technology to, to utilize um, and to essentially for the agaves to thrive. And you know, for 1500 years or so it's been abandoned. And it was just walking through this empty landscape and feeling that the, the story is half full. Um, if that, if even that. And then that trip, um, Francisco, that we were able to do pretty much exactly a year ago, my goodness, man, a year ago, right now, we were down in Michoacan with, with many dear friends um, organized by David Suro, who's gonna be our leading the tasting in just a couple hours now at 6 p.m. Uh, Arizona time this evening. And that was such an inspiration um, being together. There were um, about four or five of, of you all from the spirits industry about four or five of us from the kind of more academic, botanical side. My dad is a chef kind of thrown in there to spice <laughs> things up. And we, um, and it was just this mixing of, of perspectives. And, and I remember pretty quickly on about day three, I think it was when we were driving to, to Guadalajara on the bus and it, I felt a click happen. And that click was all of us are there because we have the same goal, which is to promote this agave culture, to really promote that beautiful relationship between people and plant and the, and the infinite ways of how both people and plants are responding and adapting to their environment and the unbelievable sense of how it captures the essence and the sense of place of a region and, the, and in the infinite depths of that. Um, and that we're all there trying to understand it better and to find ways to better promote it and to maintain it. And so uh, those inspirations are kind of a couple of the things that are driving the work we're doing right now. So this series, Agave Renaissance, is trying to communicate uh, as many facets of this human-plant relationship as we can, and, um, and talking about it from a big picture, but then also getting in really in-depth with our February speakers, Paul and Susie Fish, are going to give a, a, the lecture on the agave fields here on Tumamak Hill. Um, then we're going to go and talk to the um, to and learn from indigenous practices from Jacob Butler, who is um, uh, an Akchen uh, Atom um, uh, individual, and and hear their perspective of, of agave. Then we're going to hear about um, you know how imperiled is this relationship um, between people and this plant and and is this symbiosis imperiled? And we're gonna be hearing from David Thoreau and his work and then 
I think you just had on the Colectivo Sonora folks and you're maybe most recent and the awesome work they're doing to, to um, work with Bacanora producers in Sonora and to contain, to support sustainable harvesting and so forth. And then we're going to be talking with Alex White and others on, you know, agave as the future and, and how, um, how important this relationship is in thinking about uh, new and reinvented ways to, to continue supporting these connections. That's just on the lecture side. Each one of these lectures is paired, has a pairing with um, additional experts to dig deeper into the topics presented in the lectures and to pair those with agave spirits and to have more of a free flowing discussion. Um, and so that is the, the, the series in kind of a, a large nutshell. Um, and then we're pairing that with the, we have a, and I won't go into the details right now, I'll let you come up, I'll come up for air and let you ask some questions, but essentially in parallel, we have an agave working group. It's very similar to the arts working group I discussed, which is a, we have about 20 plus people now each of who represents a totally different um, perspective and all of them experts on how we can reinvent that uh, technology of, of utilizing agave on the landscape and, and making a model system here where we essentially um, reawaken and bring back to life the agave fields on the hill. That's awesome. I, I guess I, I want, uh... I would actually love to hear just a little bit more about the working about the work oh, about the working group that that you guys are putting together. So this is twenty across different disciplines, like all based in out of the university, or is it community members, or all you know everything? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, everything. So um, <clears throat> university folks, uh, we have uh, archaeologists, we have botanists. We're working this is on when talking about building those um you know, sustained uh partnerships with indigenous communities we're working with uh individuals from the Tonatum and and we're exploring other partnerships as well um this includes partnering with producers in mexico and and um and agave cultivators and and mezcal producers who have an incredible understanding of the landscape where we're drawing inspiration from all over. Um, and then led by kind of scientists who are leaders in this field from Wendy Hodge and Andrew Solomon at Desert Botanical Gardens, Gary Nabhan, who's worked with Agave through so much of his life, and then new students that we're bringing on as well to do their PhDs on the topic. <clears throat> so the, well, I mean, is this a real, we're, we're in a real work in process in the sense that we're just scoping it right now, but, um, so these are preliminary topics and some of the things I'm going to share haven't, we haven't even been able to discuss as the full working group yet. But one of the things that we're seeing is this, um, these agaves on the landscape are imperiled right now. And Wendy did an amazing job covering this in her overview last night. But what I mean is you have a, a, about a dozen or so domesticated agaves species taxa that are um, occur here in Arizona, either in central, northern, or southern Arizona. And they have been largely left uh, untended on the landscape in archaeological settings, um, abandoned, you know, by people, not by the people's choice on their own, but for, through um, murders or forcible relocation or cultural appropriation or whatever um, over the last since contact people have, have left these agaves and, and they're barely holding on in the landscape. And so we have, um, uh, with climate change, we, the, the increased drought, specifically the remarkable extreme temperatures we're having in summer now, how much hotter it's getting and that it's getting drier are um, killing off many of these agaves throughout the landscape in a really scary way, especially that it was, uh, aggravated this last summer by such a dry, dry summer here. And so where we're thinking, and there's a lot between these words and implementing this, of but is that uh, reestablishing the agave fields here on the hill as a biocultural arc of sorts. Um, and I mean, arc in terms of like Noah's Ark. So that we can uh, activate this, this system, the technologies in place, to maintain this, uh, these species and this connection 
between people and the land and the Agave domesticates of the Sonoran Desert, um, utilizing the, the landscape here on the hill. That's incredible, man. That sounds like such a wonderful, wonderful project. And that's, I mean, obviously you explaining just one of what I would imagine would be multiple goals for, for, that, for that project. Yeah, yeah, because then you, the, the plants serve as the anchor and then you build the culture and you, people will come and then you have the, the connectivity and the stories and the reawakening of the technology and thinking about it to do new ways and understanding how the landscape flows, how you do the water catchment, right? What is the amount of water you need? How do you replicate that? How do you scale that up? How can you do agave field rock piles elsewhere? What is the gradient you need? You know, um, what are the species that work best? How does the time work? What is the production? How do you model the productivity you get from a single agave? And then how many agaves do you need on a landscape to get such amount of protein or, or carbohydrates? How can you use that for fiber? I mean, everything emanates from that. Wow. That's fine one. That sounds so exciting. Um, we do have uh, Chad, who is uh, a good friend from, well, he's from Arizona, actually, but runs a mezcal bar in Dallas, Texas, asking if um, last night's uh, lecture was recorded. Um, and I think you mentioned that it was, but it's not available yet, uh, but it will be in the coming weeks. Is that correct? Yeah. So all one of the great things about the Zoomiverse is that we're able to really easily record, just as you're doing right now, these conversations. And then we, so that's going to be both for the lectures and the tastings. And so we're going to be, uh, it takes a little bit of post-processing time. So our turnaround is usually about five days or so. So the, we'll have the lectures posted on that website that I already shared, tumamoc.arizona.edu slash agave underscore series uh, by the middle of next week. So it'll be about a week turnaround from the actual presentation. Awesome. Um, and for those watching uh, live, uh, we did post the links to the Facebook video feed on the Vago and the Samson Surrey TV sites, as well as the YouTube live feed. So everybody should have it somewhere there in the comments section. Um, follow those links. You uh, will have to register for each uh, lecture series and, or each lecture session and each tasting session individually. So all told, I think that's like 10 different uh, registrations that you do, but it only takes a second, it's super easy. And then you get an option to add it into whatever calendar format you use, Outlook, you know, um, ICS, Google, Google Calendar, whatever. Um, I filled mine out all this morning, super easy. So really encourage you guys to go sign up and register for as many of those. If we didn't mention, uh, uh, just to watch is free. Um, the tasting portion I'm assuming uh, has some cost associated with it. If you're in Tucson and want to get your tasting uh, spirits from uh, Hotel Congress and their bottle shop there. Uh, but really, a really wonderful, a very, sounds like a very engrossing uh, series of topics and just really, really wonderful lectures that you guys are going to have on. So kudos to you for putting that together. Thank you for putting it together. Uh, and uh, thank you very much for jumping on with me this afternoon as well. Yeah, Francisco, always fun to chat. Never enough time. Um, but, you know, the, the kudos go to Todd Hanley, Delise Shepard at Hotel Congress, uh, Doug and Amy Smith at El Crisol. They are um, leading, I would say, with, with others here, including yourself, um, the education and the um, recognition of the importance of agave and agave spirits and in each of our roles in being wise consumers and supporting the great thing. So in a lot of ways, uh, another inspiration for this series is, you know, the, the Agave Heritage Festival that, that um, Hotel Congress leads and is the brainchild of Todd Hanley is uh, just this beautiful juggernaut of a series. And, you know, that's in the years to come, that's going to be one of the defining Agave events uh, internationally and one of the true prides of Tucson. Um, it, it's in a great trajectory. And so um, during the pandemic, it, this is the time when we want to continue to build that and, and to build content for everything that it's creating. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, you know, that was one of the first thoughts I had when I was kind of that, just realizing how much I'm not going to be traveling this year, uh, was lamenting the fact that obviously um, the Agave Heritage Festival would have to be canceled, um, or more than likely canceled, which was. But, uh, you know, and I was just hoping that, that, that there would be some way to reimagine it as an online format. And this really seems to be the, 
the closest the closest thing that I've seen to that. And honestly, it seems to be the best um, one of the best online series kind of, you know, I, I've seen a lot of different festivals and stuff like that, try and transition to an online format. And at least, uh, you know, within our little world, this definitely seems to be on, on paper, one of the, one of the most impressive ones. So uh, everybody involved, thank you, Todd, uh, uh, Doug, Amy, um, everybody, thank you guys so much. I know David's a big part of it. So I'll be sure to jump on this evening as well um, and, and watch that. So thank you very much, Ben, again, for jumping on with me and please take care of yourself, my friend. Francisco, always a pleasure. Salud. Thank you, man. We'll see you in a couple months. <laughs> All right, buddy. Cheers.